famous, but I'm not so sure about me. Right. right. What do you eat? reading for Kuji Jagalia is coming from having our say the Delaney sisters first 100 years. People learned not to mess with me from day one. When I was small, a neighborhood girl started taunting me. Bessie Delaney, you scrawny thing. You got the skinniest legs and the longest neck I ever did see. Now this girl was a bully and I had seen her technique before. She would say nasty things to other girls and they burst into tears and run crying to their mom. She was a lot bigger than me, but I didn't care. I said, oh, why don't you shut up? You ain't so pretty yourself. And she never bothered me again. Poppy used to say, you catch more flies with molasses than vinegar. He believed you could get further in life by being nice to people. Well, this is easy for Sadie to swallow. Sadie is molasses without even trying. She can sweet talk the world or play dumb or whatever it takes to get by without a bus. But even as a tiny little child, I wasn't afraid of anything. I'd meet the devil before day and look him in the eye, no matter what the price. If Sadie is molasses, then I am vinegar. Sadie is sugar, and I am the spice. You know Sadie doesn't approve of me sometimes. She frowns at me and her big sister straight away and says, it's a wonder I wasn't rich. Well, it's true, I almost was, but I'm still here, yes sir. What worries me is that I know Sadie's going to get into heaven, but I'm not so sure about me. I'm working on it, but it sure is hard to change. I've been trying to change for 100 years without success. That's not so good, is it? I'm afraid when I meet St. Peter at the gate, he'll say, Lord child, you want me. I have trouble with the idea of forgiving and forgetting. You see, I can forgive, but I can't seem to forget, and I'm not sure the Lord would approve of that at all. I remember things that happened long, long ago that still make me mad in the morning. I wish they didn't. Many of the things that make me mad happen to me because I'm colored. As a woman dentist, I face sexual harassment, that's what they call it today, but to me, racism was always a bigger problem. Most of the people I'm still mad at are long dead. If I say something mean about them, Sadie will say, now Bessie, if I dead, say nothing evil. And I try to be good. Sometimes I'm angry at all white people until I stop and think of the next white people I've known in my life. Okay, okay, there have been a few, I'll admit it. And my mother's part white, and I can't hate my whole flesh and blood. There's good white people out there sometimes. I mean, they're hard to find, but they're out there just look for them. But the Rebbe boys tend to stand out, make themselves known. Rebbe is what we used to call racist white men. I guess it's short for Rebbe. I tell you, the way those Rebbe types treat southern folks mm, makes us sick. If I had a pet buzzard, I'd treat them better than the way some white folks have treated me. There isn't a Negro this side of Lord who doesn't know exactly what I mean. Now, don't go thinking that I'm all me. I'm not so angry that I can't laugh at myself. One thing most Negroes learn is how to laugh at their situation. If you ask me the secret to longevity, I will tell you that you have to work at taking care of your health. But a lot of it is attitude. I'm alive out of sheer determination, honey. Sometimes I think it's my meanness that keeps me going.
Origani. Your answer should be what? That's right, Kuji Chakalia, the second day of Kwanzaa. We want to thank you so much for joining our Kwanzaa Forever program. Um, we really, really just wanted to offer you guys something to hold on to during the pandemic, something to ease, you know, the pain of not being able to celebrate Kwanzaa. One second. <coughs> No, I don't have Corona. So um, we're going to have some pretty, pretty, pretty cool things lined up for you. We have a panel um, on repatriation, okay? We have a panel on repatriation and what type of determination it takes to repatriate yourself and your family. We got some guests that actually moved their entire family to, like, a country in East Africa. You're going to hear more about it, okay? And, um, yeah, so I'm super, super, super excited that we have this to offer you all. Um, we want you to please, please, please share, like, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Share the Facebook Live video to all your family and friends and colleagues. And even maybe if you got some people that don't like you, they celebrate Kwanzaa too. Okay? So, next up, Mama Maisha is going to explain to us how we lay out our Kwanzaa table, what's on the Kwanzaa table, what are the elements of Kwanzaa. Okay? So, to you, Mama Maisha. Greetings, everyone, and Bargani. Welcome to Kwanzaa Forever. We're going to be discussing this lovely Kwanzaa setup that we have here. This is a traditional Kwanzaa setup, um, and you'll find that all Kwanzaa tables pretty much have the same elements. So we'll start with the first one, which is the Mkeka. It's a straw mat upon which the Kinara, which is the candle holder, sits. And inside the Kinara, we have the Mishuma Saba, which are the seven candles representing the seven principles of Kwanzaa. And so the way that we light these candles is we start with Umoja, which is the black candle in the middle on the first day of Kwanzaa. And then we go through all of the days, alternating between red and green, starting with the outermost candle and then moving in until we get to Imani, which is the last candle, which would be the green candle on the right. We also have our Mazal, you'll notice we have a large basket of fruit. The mazawa are the crops and they represent the wealth of our community. We also, you'll see next to the mazawa, have a kikombe cha umoja, which is the unity cup. Typically the unity cup can be used to pour libation or share a drink among family and community as part of a Kwanzaa celebration. Also in, on a typical Kwanzaa table in a house with children, we would have the ears of corn, and the ears of corn would correspond to the number of children in the family. Because this is a general Kwanzaa setup, we have a table here. It's sort of a public um, space. We don't have any children who are in this particular household. But if we were in a home, we would have um, a corresponding number of ears of corn that would match the children in the household. And finally, we have the Zawadi. The Zawadi are the gifts. And typically, gifts during Kwanzaa are homemade or handmade. As you can see, this little giraffe follows suit with that, or books and educational materials um, that will be given to our children and members of the family. So, happy Kwanzaa, and we invite you to enjoy our program. Welcome to our panel on Kujichagalia, self-determination and redefining ourselves through repatriation. I'm so happy to welcome our next guests. Uh, we have four amazing panelists, the first of whom is Swatara Olushola. She's a multifaceted wife and mother who has worked in education for five years, in the natural hair industry for 15 years, and served as a community activist for over 12 years. Swatara is a homeschooler and grassroots community educator. She's also a published author, designs African-centered educational materials for children, and serves as National Vice Chair of International Affairs for the National Black United Front. She also serves as an educator at Whole Living Academy, a virtual African-centered international school serving grades K through eight. Although Swatara is a stellar educator, she's best known for her soulful yet healthy gourmet meals and phenomenal vocal abilities. In addition, she loves sharing the ancient African tradition of hair braiding with children. Swatara currently lives in Tanzania, East Africa with her husband 
and five children. Welcome also to Mohammeda El Muhajir. She's a global brand and digital marketing and media consultant, entrepreneur, and filmmaker with extensive international travel study and work experience throughout Europe, Asia, Latin America, the Caribbean, and Africa. She's the director of strategy at Waxprint Media, a boutique digital marketing and communications agency based in Accra, Ghana. A graduate of Howard University, she has lived in Ghana for the past six years. I'd also like to welcome Marcia Olivia Wright Payne Esquire. She's armed with talent, a sharp intellect, and excellent resolution skills. A native of Arlington, Virginia, she's a 2000 graduate of Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia. During her undergraduate studies, attorney Payne also attended the Pontifica Universidad Católica Madre y Maestra in Santiago, Dominican Republic. Upon graduating from Spelman, she earned her Juris Doctorate from the Catholic University of America in Washington, DC. Attorney Payne is very active in her community. She's dedicated to mentoring youth in the Northern Virginia District of Columbia and Maryland areas through a Rites of Passage program. She's also an impeccable cook and is the creator and founder of Sweet Mossies, a culinary venture inspired by her late father, whose mission is to continue the legacy of his love of great, flavorful, locally grown and fresh food. I'd also like to welcome Mr. Marcus J. Moore. He's an award-winning music journalist, editor, curator, pundit, and author of The Butterfly Effect, How Kendrick Lamar Ignited the Soul of Black America. It's out via Atria Books Now, which is an imprint of Simon & Schuster. Mr. Moore is a contributing writer with The Nation and a contributing editor with Bandcamp Daily. His coverage of soul, jazz, hip hop, and rock can be found at the New York Times, Pitchfork, Entertainment Weekly, The Washington Post, NPR, Rolling Stone, and The Atlantic, among many other outlets. Welcome to all of our panelists today. I'm looking forward to a wonderfully dynamic discussion around the topic of repatriation and redefining ourselves. My first question is, where and when did you move and why? So first, thank you for having me. I hope you all can hear me well. Um, it was too many reasons to not stay in America. So, you know, moving to Africa is kind of generalized a lot when people say it especially being raised in an African-centered environment, you know, given an African name at birth and just always shown the continent in this kind of glamorous, almost romanticized kind of way. Um, and getting to the point, not only in America, you know, dealing with all the atrocities we have dealt with stateside and deal with stateside, um, but just becoming an adult, you know, with a family and husband, children of my own, and really having to sit back and say, you know, is America where I want them to grow up? Will they be able to grow up here? Will they be able to flourish here? Or do we want to explore and show them something different? And um, the pandemic kind of just opened the door of opportunity for us. And we walked through it. And here we are in Tanzania living. <laughs> and what made you choose Tanzania over a West African country or another East African country, even South Africa, Central Africa? What was it about Tanzania that called you? So I really say um, Tanzania chose me or chose us because I was researching a lot of different places. You know, I called you, I wanted to hear about Ghana, I wanted to hear about Nigeria, I wanted to hear about Rwanda and so many other places. Um, and I did, I heard about a lot of them, read about a lot of them, watch hours of YouTube videos as we all have. Um, and Tanzania seemed like a good place to start, just to explore. And that was the initial plan, you know, hey, let's go visit and check it out and see what it's like, maybe visit some other countries in East Africa and then make a decision and then come back. 
But um, like I said, it became more of a emergency situation. Um, there was a sense of urgency there that wasn't there before that presented itself within the pandemic. And I feel like a lot of people are really comfortable right now. And to me, it seems like things are <laughs> very chaotic and spiraling into this almost uh, pre-apocalyptic era, if you will. Um, and I'm like, okay, so if we're going to be shut down or if we're going to be um, confined to homes, I at least want to be somewhere I don't mind being forever, you know? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. let's go ahead and get to wherever that forever home might be. And of course, as soon as we touched down on the continent, as soon as we got um, to our place, even though our place right now is temporary, it felt like you know, I've been visiting America all these years. Mm. <laughs> wow. And my visit there finally over. You know, my sorry vacation there was finally <laughs> over. <laughs> and we finally got to, you know, come back home. And that's exactly what it feels like. And we just have hit the ground running since we got here. That's awesome. And so, Mohammed, you've been in Ghana for a while. Um, you know, as opposed to Swatara, who found the silver lining in the pandemic and was like, let's go. You've been doing your thing over there for a while. So what what compelled you to move um, from, because you were living, you were born in New York, yeah? Um, well, I lived all over okay. the U.S., <laughs> but I was, I lived most of, you know, for most of my time as an adult in New York, and okay. I lived there before I moved to Ghana. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I think a lot of people will tell you when you live here, it really is a spiritual calling. And I know when you don't live here, it's hard to kind of really understand. It sounds so esoteric or something. But then when you live here, you're like, oh, this is like the missing piece in my soul that I needed. I didn't even know that I needed it. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, so the, the how I moved here, I wasn't planning to move here. Right. Um, I came on a trip. I mean, I've been traveling to Africa, um, similar to similar to what um, Sw Sister Swatara said. You know, I grew up in an Afrocentric home, so I never there was never a time for me that Africa was bad. So I never had to over overcome, you know, that kind of mentality that so many people have that takes them a while. Like, so I never, I never, you know, had gone through that. So, um, but I've been traveling since I was like fifteen to to Africa, different parts. And I came on a trip one time and a, a lot had changed in Ghana. You know, I had, it had been a 10 year span, but between the times that I came here, I came first in 2003. And then um, hey. I, yeah, <laughs> I came, yeah, so, um, so I actually came then to do graduate school, but then I had it in my mind to move. That's the interesting thing. I had it in my mind then to move, but then when I came, I didn't feel like the vibe. I don't know. I was in graduate school, so I was in school all day. I couldn't get into the groove. I couldn't meet the right people, so I just didn't love it. And then it took me 10 years to come back. Um, I was just here for about four or five days on a trip, and I wasn't thinking about moving at all. By this time, I have a child, and I just was thinking, let me you know, do this trip and go back. But on that trip, everything felt right like all these things had developed in the country you know there was lots of amenities it was like this whole lifestyle this you know the modern african city the you know roads all were that better. <laughs> oh yes the roads were better. i mean it was really like a whole new world and i'm like because i think what i realize when people think about coming to africa or moving to africa at the back of our minds there's always like it's going to be this struggle mm -hmm. Right. Nobody ever thinks that they could have an easy or better life in Africa. We just don't think that we always think it's just going to be hot, which it is right now. Sorry. <laughs> but um, and it's just going to be just a struggle. And so um, that's hard for a lot of people to even think about moving. But, you know, actually, when I really saw it, I was could live the same kind of lifestyle that I was living um, in the U.S. doing the same types of things. But the beauty was that was in our homeland. So mm -hmm. that's kind of like what, what sparked it for me. Uh, we moved to Nairobi, Kenya in um, May 2019. Okay. And we is 
Oh, excuse me, my wife and I. My wife <laughs> Mabenti. <laughs> I'm just so used to saying we we have moved. Uh, Mabenti and I uh, moved in May 2019. And what was the impetus for your move there? Honestly, it was all Mabenti. Uh, she at the time was working at this spot in New York that she just did not like anymore, and she wanted to launch her own business where she's going, where, where she is uh, establishing a fund for women-owned businesses in East Africa, and it's called Live Africa. Okay. And so uh, I remember I was writing the book. I was, may have been on like chapter one or two or something, and uh, she was like, what do you think about moving to Nairobi? <laughs> and it was a five-minute conversation. And wow. so, yeah, she said that, and then we moved, like, right then and there. And so her whole impetus was, I can't have a business called Live Africa if I don't live in Africa. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. that's where we are. So now we split time, um, about six months there, six months here. So earlier this year, um, I relocated to Johannesburg, South Africa. And I moved there because I uh, was married um, January, January 29th of this year, I got married. And thank you. Prior to meeting my husband, he had already taken a job for Apple um, as the country field manager for South Africa. So he was already kind of slated to leave. It was just a matter of when, uh, when we met. And so um, after speaking a bit and deciding that we were going to be together, I decided that I would go. Um, I've traveled to the continent before, but I had not been to South Africa prior to my arrival um, the first week of March of this year. Um, and so that is um, how I ended up in South Africa, how I chose South Africa. It actually chose me and how I ended up in Johannesburg. What can you tell me has been your biggest revelation slash challenge in moving to the continent? I would say the biggest revelation is for me personally is that uh, I didn't realize just how much they deferred to American culture and Americans before I moved there. Because when you're when you're uh, a black American, when you're a black person growing up here, here being you know the states now, um, you're you're kind of used to being a little bit invisible. You know, not saying that that's good, but you're used to being like other. You know what I mean? So you you kind of walk around with this this tension that you don't realize you have until you move to the continent. And then once you move there and you still have that mentality of being sort of invisible, they don't see you that way. You know, once you, you we identify as local until we start speaking. Mm -hmm. And then once they hear that American accent, that's when the free food starts coming out. That's when the <laughs> the free coffee and all of this and 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 it kind of put me in a weird space because I don't want that, you know? I don't, I don't, I've seen where Kenyans will treat other Kenyans poorly, but if they feel like you're of means or you're from, you're from America, then they just sort of assume that you, you know, can provide a way out or you can provide some sort of access or a pipeline or something like that. So that was the biggest revelation, the biggest challenge. Um, Little stuff, little stuff would happen that would kind of annoy me. So it's like I'm on deadline, then all of a sudden the power goes out, or or like uh, you know you call an Uber and it may take like ten minutes, you know. And it's just little things you're not used to dealing with, especially when you grow up in the states and everything is just so fast and so efficient that when you're there, you have to remind yourself to, you know, just sort of take a step back because you're not. We're, we're, we're all ingrained and in, it's ingrained in us to grow up with the sort of tension, the sort of pressure, but you don't realize until you get there that, you know, they're actually, they know how to live because not everything is dire or immediate. Like, you know, they sort of treat it here in the States. One thing that um, I think is just such an eye opener on a daily basis is really like just the level of wealth that people have here, like, you know, you kind of, we always have been taught that Africa is poor and, you know, I mean, just, yeah, then you realize, you know, we have nothing compared to these people. Sometimes I'm in my neighborhood and I'm like, who's driving a Bentley? Like, who is this? I'm just like, who, I mean, who's Marvin? Look, who are these people? 
I was just like, who are they, right? Or people <laughs> will send me emails all the time and they'll be like, oh, I have this land, you know, do you want to buy it? Um, you know, it'll be like, oh, or this house and it'll be like, oh, it's $250,000. I could split it up in three payments. You're like, we used to 30 years. I, I'm just like, <laughs> who has that kind of money just sitting in the bank? And then that's not all the money, you know, like right. that's the money for the house. Like, so the level of wealth just... We're not ready for it. We think that we're balling. Everybody who's balling at home, they're balling on credit. They're balling on credit. These people, there is no credit. There is no mortgages. There's no leasing of any cars. None of that. They're like That's all new. And nobody here with money is even doing that. So that is the big revelation that I think shuts all the Black Americans down. Right. Right now, they like, you think this is the flex? No, this is the flex. <laughs> I think the biggest challenge was really kind of rooted around COVID and nothing more. Um, because when I moved, the lockdown happened mm -hmm. the week later. So I had just met the threshold of the mandatory, the mandatory quarantine mm -hmm. in South Africa, such that I didn't have to do that. Um, so anybody else who kind of flew in, I believe even the day after me, were kind of forced to go back to the airport, go into quarantine, that type of thing. But I didn't have to do that. Um, beyond uh, COVID, though, I would say the, tr the transition to South Africa had you know, was pretty amazing. But for that, um, I, South Africa has a very large population, well, relatively speaking, they have a nice population of um, Americans, Black Americans who live there and who have formed um, kind of groups and societies to support each other. Um, there are also, I'm a Delta, and there's also other Deltas in South Africa, and there's work that my sorority does in South Africa. So there's the link there. Um, and then being in Johannesburg, essentially, is living in the city. And so you don't miss out on the things that you're used to having here at home. So I would say that the biggest thing was just learning the idiomisms, the, the with the language, the, you know, saying trunk, means something completely different um, and understanding the small cultural pieces with language probably was the biggest thing than anything else. Growing up African centered and in that environment, you know, there's that hurdle that a lot of people have to get over with coming here, um, only being shown the negative aspects or stereotyped aspects of the continent, but I didn't have to deal with that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I kind of knew what I was coming to, even though I knew that um, certain amenities would not be available that I have grown used to stateside. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you're looking for 100 percent electricity all the time, that's not a reality here. So don't expect that. You know, if you're looking for 100 percent Wi-Fi all the time, it's not a reality here. You know, it's a. I'm supposed to be on this call, so that's why the Wi-Fi is working now. <laughs> but, um, you know, if you're that type of person where you need everything to be a particular kind of way, right, when you need it to be that way, mm -hmm. then you there, that won't be your reality here. If you're thinking about coming here or even visiting here, you know, mm -hmm. will your visit be okay if you don't have electricity all the time? Um, but I knew I was coming to uh, a place where 80% of the people here are in agriculture, you know, mm -hmm. and it's nothing for it to be a huge garden in your backyard, you know, wow. where you can go pick food and then come in the house and cook it. Mm -hmm. And this is what we, especially coming from Houston, you know, it's, it's almost like, oh, we need a community garden. We need an urban garden. Like that's almost cliche here. Mm -hmm. It's like, what do you mean you're not growing your food? What do you eat? <laughs> right, right. What do you eat? Like, even on this call and other calls I've done, at any given moment, you might hear a rooster or mm -hmm. some cows or, you know, a goat. And that's just, that's a part of life here. So, um, I don't know about a revelation or a challenge because I prepared myself as well as I could. Um, but, uh, I guess it, I guess it would be for me getting around because I'm a you know go go go. I used to be a go 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 type of person, and I've learned the beauty and relaxing and how a black woman resting is revolutionary. I've learned that and embraced it. <laughs> how 
how did your expectation of living abroad differ from the reality of living there? Given the amount of time that I've spent in Ghana, I was expecting South Africa to be, um, at least Johannesburg, to be more of a Black experience. So it was a challenge for me to be on the continent and look around and not see tangibly um, Black people who were um, at least middle class or Black people who were kind of controlling their own space and their own environment. It was very much so, um, or it is very much so white driven um, in the city, whereas, you know, the Black people are kind of around and about, but they're working, they're in more servitude type of positions. Whereas in Ghana, you kind of feel like I'm home. And the culture is all around you. I feel like in South Africa, you know, I went drawn to a culture. I was went. I'm looking for like, where can I find a Sangoma? Where can I find this? Where can I find that? And everything was kind of underneath stuff. And then there's this whole image of Johannesburg. So that part um, has definitely been a shock and has left it not as appealing as I would say being in West Africa. The food in Tanzania is not really what I expected it to be. I really, I had, um, you know, I'm used to the bold, bold flavors of Nigeria or Ghana, other places on the continent, Liberia. You know, I'm used to punch you in the mouth flavors and execution of cooking. But the cooking here is very, very simple. You know, I find myself trying to spice up plates that I get or just recreate them in some way to make them interesting to my palate. So I will say um, I had an expectation of um, more exciting food, if you will. I always tell people when you come, it's better to have no expectations. I mean, I know that's like a difficult thing to do, um, but I find that a lot of um, our people, when they come to Ghana or to the continent, they have like, we're almost like these adopted children who's been dreaming about their birth mother and how wonderful she's gonna be. And then when we meet her, she's kind of messed up and we like, our hearts are crushed. You know, that's how I feel like, you know, a lot of, you know, African-Americans when they come, they think that they're gonna be drumming on the streets and everyone is going to be like, my brother, my sister, you have come home. And, and a reality is that most Ghanaians, I'm here in Ghana and I imagine it's, it's probably um, like this on most other in most other countries, most modern day, you know, especially young African people have very little knowledge about um, our history, you know, how we actually got to where we are. I mean, for them, we probably just seem like some black people who are in a, any other country that, you know, could be in Congo or whatever. We just happen to be in America. Like they don't know how we got there. They don't even know like how, that we're connected to them. Right. So I feel like that is just a reality that um, it's, it's a major challenge for a lot of people. For those people who are looking to drop everything and move to the continent, they're ready to quit America or Europe or the Caribbean or wherever in the diaspora they may be. What would be the top three pieces of advice you would give someone before moving? I would say one, relax, you know. And, and I'm saying that because um, I didn't do that because I get I came over there with a deadline with these expectations. And so I would say you definitely just got to relax and, and chill for the most part, um, because the city is going to slow you down and they're going to, you know, um, you know, they're, they're going to they're going to take some of the stress that you've been living with away. Secondly, I would say get out of get out of the immediate city and go to places beyond nairobi you know so i would say I, I guess nairobi is beautiful um but you don't realize just how beautiful kenya is until you go like an hour outside of it to like the national parks and and, and places like that and three honestly with kenya 
there's a very heavy expat culture. There are, you're going to meet a ton of Americans there, a ton of Italians, Chinese, whoever. Um, so it's a very, it's a light and it's a very easy landing spot. And so what I would say to that then is just, you know, uh, fellowship, communicate, um, hang out with people, go to, go to the local, go, go to the local cafes, um, because you're going to see somebody who's doing something similar to what you're doing. Um, number one, I would say visit first and visit with someone who lives there. Don't go just on holiday or on a vacation, like go and visit someone who has been living there for a period of time so that you can get a true feel of where you're going. Um, so that's number one. Um, number two, understand the reason why you're going. Like, what are you going to do? Are you going because you're called to do some work there? So you need to connect with some women to work with, you know, uh, an issue, for instance, gender-based violence or something like that. Are you, are you going to do work? Are you going there because you are um, looking for a vacation home? Because if that be the case, maybe living in Johannesburg is not the best choice for you. You may want to live in Durban or uh, Cape Town where it's more, uh, it's beaches and um, not the city life uh, for the most part. So you need to analyze that as well before going. Um, otherwise, I would say just go. There is nothing more than, um, nothing more amazing than a leap, especially when you're talking about um, moving to the continent. I would say most people I know who live in various parts of, of Africa have all found their way home there. Uh, leave your Western expectations in the West or wherever you're coming from, whatever you're used to there, wipe that slate clean and expect to become one with the land, it's the motherland. Expect to become one with nature. Expect to live off the land. Expect to build off the land. Um, and that's me speaking from being in rural Tanzania. Um, if people want to get in touch with you or see some of the things that you're doing, what's the best way for them to be able to do that? Uh, you can follow us on YouTube, subscribe to our YouTube channel, uh, Black to Africa, B-L-A-C-K-T-O Africa. Um, we put a lot of our everyday comings and goings, going places and visiting and all of that, just chats on that YouTube channel and then on Instagram at Let's Go Black to Africa. And okay. that's the email as well. Uh, Let's Go Black to Africa at Gmail. So yeah, you can hit us up on any one of those outlets. If you want to get in touch with me or find out what in the world am I doing and where in the world I am, because things are constantly moving and changing, you can go to love marciaolivia.com that's l-o-v-e-m-a-r-c-i-a-o-l-i-v-i-a.com and on the website you can send me a direct message you can get an update on my travels because i typically will blog about it or you'll see something there still developing um but you can reach out ask me any question um all the links to my different stuff is on the site so law food everything else that i have going on is there so um that's the easiest place to find me and I'm on Instagram and social and Facebook and Twitter also. So love Marcia Olivia. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty easy to find. It's um, Twitter at Marcus J. Moore, um, Instagram underscore Marcus J. Moore. Um, the book is pretty much everywhere and it's called The Butterfly Effect, How Kendrick Lamar Knighted the Soul of Black America. Um, it's on Amazon. It's on in the, get it through independent bookstores though. <laughs> so do that. Uh, other than that, yeah, my next project is, um, you know, other than writing articles, I'm writing a book called High and Rising about, uh, uh, about De La, about De La Soul. So that's what I'll be working on for the next year. Let's give a virtual round of applause for that panel discussion. And let's give another virtual round of, of applause for Father Feeling Khan Percussion Ensemble. They've been holding it down. Woo. So we want to thank you all for joining our seven day virtual Kwanzaa event. Today was day two. This was Kuji Chakalia, which means self-determination. And I want you all to walk away from today's, from today's program with just some much needed energy to carry out 
through the rest of the week. Today is Sunday. Tomorrow is Monday. And, you know, we all have that Monday blues sometimes. So I just want you to stay determined. Keep pushing yourself. If you got to go into work tomorrow, for all my frontline workers, we appreciate you during this time. If you got to head downstairs and hop on that Zoom, we appreciate you. You got it. Okay? You got it. We hoping that this program, this offering, this free offering gives you some much needed energy to proceed with the rest of the week. All right. So tomorrow we have some super cool stuff. Tomorrow is the third day of Kwanzaa, which is Ujima. And Ujima means collective work and responsibility. So we're going to be talking to some, some local young leaders. Um, and which I'm, I think I'm hosting. Yeah, I think I'm hosting tomorrow's event um, or tomorrow's program. And we're really, really going to see what they've been doing during this pandemic and how they've been, you know, working with our communities here in the Washington, D.C. area and abroad, too, globally. So we're really looking forward to that. Oh, yeah, we have a special guest on Ujima who's been doing something super big in, in, in Morocco. Um, and I, I don't want to give it away too much, but it's going to be super cool. All right. So thank you guys for tuning in again. Please like share and subscribe the video send it out to your friends send it out to your family send it out to your colleagues and even some people that may not like you but you know they celebrate Kwanzaa so go ahead and shoot it to them okay please please thank you so much thank you so much the Adinka group we want to thank you for tuning in and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow peace